Hello, fellow procrastinators. Today's guest is Lady Klutz. He is a professor at the University of Virginia, and he studies the science of design. Uh, he describes it as how we transform things from how they are to how we want them to be. Uh, Lady is also someone who wants to apply his work. Uh, he's, as we discuss on the pod, he wants to address climate change. He wants to address systematic inequality and is someone who also works, uh, you know, in addition to his academic work directly with fancy organizations, including the World Bank. Uh, he's written more than 80 articles he's written two books and today we talk about his new paper along that he's written with a group of excellent co-authors and the paper is called people systematically overlook subtractive changes it's a paper that i love and one which was recently on the cover of nature in the interview we also talk about his new book called subtract the untapped science of less uh, this book unfolds the ideas behind the paper on a much bigger canvas, basically. And uh, I should also say, outside of science, uh, Lady is an interesting person. Before becoming a professor, as we also discuss on the pod, he was out in the real world working, managing the design and construction of big engineering projects. And even before that, he was someone who played professional soccer. But let me get out of the way. Let's get into the conversation. Here's the podcast. <laughs> Maybe we should. Well, let's let's kind of okay, good, good. Yeah, we're sorry. In, kind of in it now. No, no, but a bit, yeah, because yeah. I want to use it to compliment you uh, to say that actually I'm cutting way down on podcast, and and so I got to pre-read your book a little bit. Uh, that's also coming out, even though I uh, I promised to be uh, too lazy to read it. I did actually take a take a look at it. I really like it, and 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 one of the things is this kind of this busy trap and the value of giving your brain some space. And one of the downsides of podcasts, even though I love them, is that they they remove this last uh, bastion of uh, free mind space that we have as we're going from one place to another or doing the dishes or whatever. So, so actually I, I cut way down. So I, I listen once in a while to WTF as the, as the only one. But I used to listen to uh, one I really loved is called Doug Loves Movies. I don't know if okay. you know this one. Mm -mm. Maybe we're cutting this. No one cares what I listen to. But anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. But um, but yeah. But but Doug loves movies has a big recommendation. But I'm I'm cutting down on I'm cutting down on podcasts. Yeah, you should you should put like ten minutes of dead air at the end of your podcast for people to to think and digest. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, instead of the since I'm since I'm paid by uh, funded by funding agencies and the university, I'm not putting any ads in there. So maybe I should put uh, Mindspace, yeah. Mindspace in instead. But but let's 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 slowly get started and talk about you. So so uh, a kind of uh, poorly hidden secret behind this podcast is that. It's called too lazy to read the paper, but we don't just talk about the paper. One of the excuses I have is to kind of find interesting people. And then a lot of them here in the beginning, I already know, and I get to ask them questions. I would be embarrassed to ask them if we're having a beer. And now I also get to talk to cool people like you and ask them. And before the podcast, I did a little internet search and it looks like you have like an even more unusual history than most people in coming into science. So you have to tell me, little bit about how does one go from being a kind of com competitive pro level soccer player to becoming a professor how did how did that come about yeah yeah one of the hopes for this paper is that it helps my internet search not just turn up the professional soccer uh, so, and i wasn't very good at professional soccer i mean i i uh I played for a couple of years in like the second division in the United States i was making two thousand dollars a month um but i mean my life up till that point was revolved around soccer in the United States. Um, it's nice in that the you can still do like kind of the highest level of soccer and go through the university system. So it wasn't like I was sacrificing my education. But in terms of I certainly wasn't this undergrad student who was going into the professor's office asking if there were research opportunities. I was focused on soccer. Um, yeah. And then after after um, after I realized I needed to get a real job or think about what I was going to do with my life, I, I worked for a little while. I, my my major was civil engineering, um, and so I did 
kind of construction management. And right. that was fine. Uh, it sounded better than some of the jobs that my friends had, but, um, that was the time where I started to think, okay, well, I'm going to be working the rest of my life. I might as well figure out something that is, uh, I feel like I'm making a contribution to society and that I like. Uh, and so that's when I started thinking about, you know, research and, and teaching too. I mean, teaching was really the thing that I thought I would like with the career shift. And, um, so, uh, that's when I started thinking about being a professor. Um, my dad's a professor. Uh, it's interesting though. Uh, my dad's a professor, but I was five years out of college before I realized that to do a PhD, it doesn't typically cost students money. Uh, so yeah. I was sitting there, it was like not on my mind because I'm, there's no way I'm going to pay, yeah. pay tuition for five years to do this thing. I'm not right. sure. And, and then my parents or my dad said, well, yeah, you actually, you wouldn't probably have to pay tuition and you might get an assistantship. And so that's one of the things I try yes. to tell students in my classes so that they uh, know that this is actually an, a feasible thing to do. Um, and I, I had always had like kind of environmental leaning. So my research um, after, while I was working, I, uh, I did my master's degree online uh, so that I could kind of minimize the time that I was out of getting paid a significant mm -hmm. amount of money and, and, uh, and then went back for my PhD looking at kind of sustainability in the built environment. So it kind of merged my interest with, you know, make, helping with environmental problems like climate change and my background in, in the built environment. And there's obviously a, a lot of opportunities to, um, to make things better in that area. And so that's, you know, I, that, I did my PhD and then got my first faculty position in that area. Um, the longer that I've been working in this area, though, you know, this kind of brings us up to the to the paper is, you know, it's really about the, well, with sustainability in the built environment and with addressing climate change in our buildings, for example, I mean, we know how to do it. Um, yes. It's not, there's not technological barriers to having a net zero energy home for example, uh, but we're just, no. we're not. And I, I mean, we should still keep trying to advance the technology, of course, but this is an example of like, well, it's something, there's also kind of our mindsets. Um, and so I got more and more interested in behavioral science. Um, I yes. actually moved moved universities. I mean, I, I was at Clemson University before and loved it there. <laughs> I loved the people I worked with, um, but I moved to University of Virginia because they have more um, more behavioral scientists kind of working in this area and the the result you know five years after moving has been this this paper and it's the result of you know me being interested in this but also finding amazing collaborators who are equal co-authors on the paper yes. um so yeah no, no, but it, i mean it shows and it's such a nice insight i think this thing that it's not like you know i sort of I come from physics, working in algorithms, and now I'm interested in behavior because that's also something we need to understand as we are training data as behavior and as, as we're making predictions and trying to understand systems of behavior. So it's interesting to see how behavior and understanding behavior creeps in uh, everywhere in that sense. Um, but I want to I want to come back to this still, you know, like you say that it wasn't a high level and in, in a way um you know i'm a, a non-sportsman and i understand that even if it's not at a high level you must have been insanely good and you know like the differences up there are very small and it requires a lot of discipline and i remember i remember i i had a co-author who was you know some some country's champion of kickboxing and this guy was super mild and you would never know that he was a killing machine, first of all. And second of all, his self-discipline was just unbelievable. You know, like uh, the, 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 the thing that uh, I hope everyone, almost everyone can identify with in the podcast is his procrastination theme. But this guy did not procrastinate. He was just like, you know, like he would do insane, really good, high quality research. We just put a paper on PNAS with him. Very high quality research until you know, noon, and then he would just head to the gym. And because he wanted to get his, I don't know, zone two training in, he would just sit on the treadmill for six hours, you know, going at some pace, and then he would go and he would beat people up for a couple hours, and then he'd go to bed, wake up and do the research. So I assume some of this must also be driving you this discipline or yeah, you have to tell my wife that that's a good thing, right? <laughs> she so she gets mad at my my regimented schedule. And yeah, I mean, I I uh, 
I downplay, I mean, it was, it took everything I had to get to that level of soccer. And I think that that does kind of transition over into the, <laughs> into, into my work now. Um, yeah. I also, I mean, I think like when I'm looking for PhD students, I want to know what, what do you do? What else do you do? Right. You know, yeah. so you got, you got good grades and what, what else are you, um, good at? And, uh, I think that, um, yeah, so I do think, I don't mean to downplay the, that level of soccer. And I also think that it's certainly the, the things that I've learned, the discipline, also the teamwork, uh, yes. is huge. Right. I mean, you know, some of this stuff, you know, we go to these trainings as faculty members of here's how you should treat people when you're working in groups. And you're like, well, this is so obvious. You know, I've spent my whole first 20 years of my life trying to figure out how to do this, how to make the the team greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, there's a lot of carryover there. Yeah, absolutely. I, be, I believe very strongly also in teamwork and this, this concept of psychological safety that you're not mm. going to perform well unless you feel that people have your back. You're not going to perform well if you feel like people are going to be, you know, uh, if you make a mistake, you need to be able to make it without people blaming you. And I guess that must also be the case when you're playing soccer, right? That someone, if someone screws up, you can't, you can't just be, uh, you know, making them feel terrible because it'll lower the whole team's performance, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's that, you know, 99% of the time, <laughs> you've got to lift the other person up, there is like 1% of the time where you got to give somebody a little kick in the butt, right. But um, yeah, it's I, I used to write a, a plus on my hand when I was playing soccer, because to remind myself not to like yell at other people when they screwed up. Um, and so it's, uh, it's certainly, um, certainly a transferable thing across the across sports and academia. But I also, I mean, at some, you must have also had some kind of curiosity, right? Because I see also in reading your book that you're, you're, you're trying to, in the, in, in the book, and we should, you know, I don't know how, I don't know how to even, there's a book coming out, everyone. Uh, <laughs> I got okay. to read, <laughs> I yeah. got to read a little bit. You should tell us about it, I guess. Um, but in seeing that, you're also covering a very large literature. And I, I suppose part of it comes from, writing this amazing paper that we'll be talking about, but you you kind of go well beyond the paper and kind of sketch, you know, ramifications for some of your cool discoveries in, in a lot of other fields. So, so I, I have a sense, and, and maybe it's to that, that also you you've must have also been kind of broadly interested in many different things. Yeah, I mean, I've always liked thinking. I mean, one of the stories I tell in the book is I like, I mowed lawns when I was, for my summer job growing up. And, you know, so that gives you a lot of time to stand behind a lawnmower and just think. And, you know, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy thinking about things. And what I love about science is um, it can take your kind of your own musings that aren't really grounded in anything and really kind of take them a few notches up. Um, and so, so yeah, I cert I, what I like to do aligns with this aligns with this job. Like you mentioned psychological safety. We've got a, one of my favorite things about new students is that they come in with their ideas and I've got a PhD student now who's like, okay, we, we should study psychological safety and how this impacts engineering design. And so, um, yeah, definitely curious about a lot of things. Yeah. No, and, and and I mean, and that uh, to me is the luxury of the job is that you can, you can find yeah. something you're interested in and then you can, uh, I mean, I'm sure if you wanted to write about, I don't know, like the narrative structure of Ulysses, probably they'd get mad at you. But, you know, within reason, you can you can really explore kind of a wide array of phenomena. And and, and so so it's it is a pretty, it's a pretty sweet uh, gig to be a professor in many ways. Yeah, that's one of the things I tell my yeah, I, I'm, I'm very thankful that I worked in industry before um, becoming a professor. I, I did it for five years. I probably should have done it for one. I would have gotten the same like. Uh, recognition how lucky we are in academia to be able to chart our own path, right? And so for me, it's the perfect blend of being able to do what I want, but also having this, like you mentioned, psychological safety. I mean, just financial safety, right? It's like, yes. if you owned your own business, you could do what you want, but you're constantly worried about where the next paycheck's coming from. I mean, academia, we sacrifice some on the salary, but for the most part, we get to think about what we want, which is just I just think is priceless. Um. It's, an, it's an incredible privilege. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think, I mean, the only, the only saving grace is that 
you know, a, a lot of times something really good for society comes out of this kind of endeavor. Yeah. There's a lot of wasted time too, but it seems that we have no better process of generating really awesome and weird ideas than to just say, all right, you guys go nuts. And, and, and yeah. And, and so it's hard. No, to, I, I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I totally agree. I think that, uh, and that's the, that's the responsibility, right. Is to try to, um, to do our best at this so that we can, you know, hopefully generate things that help, help society. Um, and I agree completely though, that the, 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 the whole endeavor makes sense. Um, and, you know, provides a lot of good to, to society. I guess we're, we're preaching to the choir there, but uh, exactly. yeah. I feel like we, we have to move on uh, yeah. because we're just, we're agreeing too much. I, was, <laughs> okay. I had a whole, yeah. uh, another half hour. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> So let's let's turn around and say so. One of the things you did was that you had a kind of amazing insight, um, which is that um, you had a sense that there was something different about removing stuff than adding stuff. And so I I know the kind of a little bit about the backstory because I saw the book. But first, I just saw this pristine uh, paper in Nature just, uh, explaining this idea and making this really strong argument, but, but maybe you, you can take us through kind of what is your main idea and how did, how did it get to you? Because I think it is in many ways, um, I mean, you know, like, uh, so I looked at the book, you know all the quotes, right? And we know that Steve Jobs is famous for removing complexity from software. We know that Picasso draws these things that were just a line. We somehow associate simplicity with genius, but I think you, you, you kind of, you take something that's something that a lot of us see casually and you quantify it and you you kind of make it uh, scientific and I, I love it. So tell us how you how you got there. Yeah, um, I mean, the <laughs> as close the as there question. was to an yeah, as close as there was to an epiphany, I was playing with my son Legos um, and he was I, three at two or three at the time and um, we were building a Lego bridge. And the problem was that the um, the bridge wasn't level. And uh, so I turned around to get a block to add to the shorter column. And by the time I had turned back around, he had removed a block from the longer column. And um, and it just crystallized. I'd always been interested in last, like these kind of Steve Jobs quotes you mentioned, um, the, yeah, Picasso, Da Vinci, Lao Tzu. I mean, it, like it goes, it's deep. Uh, it goes yeah. way back, all these people reminding us to take things away to make things better and I could never like kind of get to the essence of what we actually wanted to study and even with even with like Legos Ezra's bridge Ezra's my son's name even with that bridge example it it, it was a big step for me but it didn't really set in until I started sharing it with other people um, and yeah. so I, I was taking the bridge around and uh, I would like test it on my grad students to see what they did and everybody added and Gabe Adams who's um, a co-author on the paper and all you know uh, yeah again we were all equal co-authors on this we're kind of splitting up the the talking about it so I'm just here as the as the mouthpiece but sure. um, Gabe Adams, Ben Converse, and Andy Hales are all co-authors right I had been talking with Gabe about my interest in like environmental things and why we don't do, you know, some of the, why we don't get to less, but I, I never talked about it in a way that made sense to her. You know, she was, she's super nice, but she would always kind of say, Oh, what are, what are your other ideas? You know, and it was obvious that this, she didn't see this as something worthy of our time. And so I took the Lego bridge to her and put it down on her desk. I was like, solve this. And I, I expected her to subtract because I thought that I had been talking to her about this whole idea for the whole time, but yeah. she added, and then I told her what Ezra did. And she said, Oh, so, so what you're thinking about is, is that we, sh we, um, we don't think to subtract, to make things better. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. yeah, that's what I've been saying. But, um, and she's like, that's an amazing idea. We get that's, I don't think anybody's ever done that. And then she got um, Ben Converse, uh, who is her friend and, you know, down the, um, you know two doors down in terms of office space and he's like a he's big in judgment and decision making you know and really strong in doing um experiments and so she's like we should bring in ben on this uh and ben was working with andy's a postdoc working with ben who's also you know he's now andy's now a professor so um th th then we kind of had had the dream team but it started with ezra's bridge um and then it kind of what 
it mattered, I think, that Gabe and I had already been talking about ways to work together. Uh, and I, I think it also is, I mean, if Gabe and I had run off and studied one of these less influential ideas that I had brought to her, maybe we wouldn't have done this project. So um, yeah, it, it can, but, and I think, you know, if they were here, they would say that that they never would have thought about it this way coming from their discipline it took like an engineer um to to even like frame the problem that way um so i think that that's where the kind of the interdisciplinary part of it is is cool but i think that yeah. there's something more also going on that that i mean because it's it, to kind of make it good research you have to do you have to have two steps that you're outlining and I and I agree a lot like so what I do is I work with data that other people have collected and then I also have a lot of random ideas so some better than others most of them terrible and then you know like the connection is first to kind of find a way where your idea is somehow expressed a little bit more sharply or a little bit more clearly right it's but the, in a way like if we talked about comedy probably before what we'll include in the podcast and what comedians do is they make these observations they see all the weird stuff around us and they talk about it and so Seinfeld is a good kind of half of a scientist because he makes the this observation <laughs> right but then you also have to it's not enough to see that it's there and for other people to recognize it you also have to bring in this whole apparatus of creating data on it in a way that other scientists will listen to and so on so so that's also what i'm hearing in a way right that you you had this loose thing you you've found the nugget that you could have done stand up about and then you you then have a big group and and you you had some pretty ingenious ways also of showing this so maybe so we're beginning i guess to talk about the paper and I, I yeah, I was going to say, I mean, we haven't even got, this was all four years ago, right? I mean, we haven't even gotten into the work of the the research. Um, and I, I I love the stand-up analogy. I mean, I, I one of the reasons I like those podcasts, um, and I'm like you, I, don't, I haven't inundated myself with them after, you know, getting into this research and realizing that it wasn't, it was distracting. But um, as you see, like Bill Burr, or one of these people, basically workshopping their jokes right and it's like this is this is the first time he talked about it and look how different it is when it comes out in his one hour netflix special and yes. so you realize that that tweaking is incredibly important for the you know for getting to a research question and it never stops yes. i mean it's not like we had it figured out when gabe and i were talking and we just needed to get the data to prove it i mean it, we we totally shaped our question through the research um and and even now, as we're talking to people, it's like, oh, you know, this really isn't hitting home if we describe it this way. We need to describe it this other way. Um, Absolutely. Anyway, so, so that, yeah, incredibly, incredibly important and, and time consuming and, and well worth it. I think, uh, yeah, Richard Thaler, he's, he won a Nobel Prize in uh, like kind of behavioral economics type things. Um, in the, and he, he, he's a big proponent of this, like kind of, you know, refine, 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 refine the, the wording. Um, so, but your question was about like, okay, what happened after we had the, yeah, the thing I mean, we, we wanted to study? We can also go down the rabbit hole of increasing quality by iteration. And I yes. think that is one of the ways to get to less. That's one of the ways to subtract is by throwing the same stuff at people. So, so and, I, and you also actually explore that in an experiment so, so it all connects, but yeah, but yeah. So, so this thing that you're talking about, I, I'm a huge, I agree. I could not agree more that you make things good normally if you're a normal person, and I consider myself a, I mean, within certain uh, parameters of normalcy that could be debated, uh -huh. and my wife could have some other uh, attitudes and so on. But, but if if you're not a stone cold genius and you just write down beautiful, clear prose, then iteration improvement makes ideas better jokes better and it, it's one of the paths to simplicity right so 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 and you explore that so maybe we can come come back to it or something when you when you just yeah kind of what you i think i can work that into the into the experiments but i yeah and i think it's but that is a key distinction right and i think that's one of the mental traps holding us back and this is more booky than uh than paper-ish because i don't know that we no okay. proved it in the paper but like this no. This idea that less is easy um, and 
is just wrong, right? It's and in, in fact, it's harder, you know, because you have to you have to have the you have to have added first, and then you have to get rid of the work that you've already done, and you have to keep pushing best when you know, hey, maybe this was already good enough. You just want to make it absolutely perfect, um, and so that no, but that I meant, is an what, important. What I meant in the paper was like a simpler, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. There's a simpler test that just says that people get better at seeing the subtraction, even in the simple experiments that you do in the paper, if they get to do it more than once. Right. Yep. That's all. But but yep. then there's true that in the in the book, uh, in one of the later chapters, there's also something about iteration. And I wrote yep. you a long letter uh, because <laughs> I was, you know, I write a lot of those because I couldn't couldn't make it a short, beautiful one. But yeah. but definitely. So the experiments, we'll go to right to the experiments from the paper. I mean, mm -hmm. we built from the Lego experiments, one of our first, we did all these observational studies. Uh, so we give people a mass of Legos that already assembled and say, make this better. And, you know, one out of 60 people decided to take something away. Um, and, you know, we, we were doing these observational studies in different contexts. And then this is where, you know, I never would have been able to think of this on my own or to realized that this was a, an experimental thing to do on my own was like, okay, we're observing this, but how do we set up experiments that explains a little bit more about like why this is happening and, and what's, what's going on in our minds to make this happen? Because, you know, all the people adding to Legos, you could explain just by saying, well, they all grew up playing with Legos and the Lego instructions tell us to add. It's just, that's, you know, and, and even though we had this across all kinds of different contexts, you could basically, it, with each one of them, you could explain it away somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so we started to do these, you know, the repetition experiment is one that you're mentioning. And so we had evolved our experimental paradigm too, so that, you know, to take the, basically take the context out. So any kind of critique about, well, this is how we're conditioned to play with Legos. We had created a, a paradigm on the computer screen where it was basically grid patterns on a computer screen and you were trying to make the patterns symmetrical. Um, so what was interesting about that is you could say that, well, there's people haven't encountered this before. There's no inherent value to the patterns on the computer screen. And, um, and people were adding more than they subtracted on those. And so when we started to do experiments and like in that we had a control condition and an experimental condition, one of the things we did was introduce repetitions. Um, and so we'd ask people to solve these grid patterns multiple times and so you say okay do this five times it's the exact same grid and then at the end say which way did you like best which did you prefer and um what was happening was you know they they think of the subtract subtractive thing on the fourth or third or fifth iteration maybe and if they did think of it they'd say oh yeah that's that's the best one because i mean we had set up these patterns so that it was fewer clicks to subtract for yeah. example um and so that's proof that um that shows that they're when you do think when they do think about it, they actually like it. Um, because one of the you, the overarching critique you could make of all the observational studies is that well, people just like it. What's wrong with that? You know, they're just picking what they like. Who are you to say that this thing is better if they like it? And this the repetition showed that well, in fact, they they just aren't thinking of it. And what's also interesting about the repetitions it is, is it really gives you insight into what's going on or what we think is going on in the brain which is that we're it's not that we can't think of taking away right it's just that our default is okay what can we add to this situation to make it better and oftentimes we've added you know in the case of this experiment they add solve the grids and move on and you never think about okay what could we take away and because you never think about it you never realize that it it might be better yeah, but I, I also think, and so so I love this work, I have to say, right? And so I thought a lot about it in the time that I knew that we had to talk. And so when we're done with the paper, I have a lot of uh, questions I want your feedback, uh, feedback on. But one of the things I notice is that I think one of the reasons, so, so you know, I, I, nothing is tested here. This is just like soon as the hypothesis yeah. generating uh, machine you're now meeting, right? And we all do that. Yeah. Um, is that one of the reasons it's difficult is that it's not in all situations that we can take away, right? So, so mm -hmm. it, let's say that you have a social relationship with someone and let's pick your wife, right? And she, 
asks you, uh, how do I look in this dress? Now, if you say the wrong thing, you may inadvertently say the wrong thing. Uh, you would say, well, I didn't mean it, but you can never take it back, right? Like once it's out, it's out there. Yeah. It's not you can be like, actually, you know, like uh, the color is uh, great for you or whatever. <laughs> yeah, not, that's not what I meant, yeah. And, and in any relationship, there is this kind of thing that, so, so I think part of why this is difficult for us, if I think about it, is that there are so many categories where we can't simplify. Do you know what I mean? That, that are strictly, and, and I mean, I, I won't bore you with it, but because it's not your field, but I think there's some deep connections to entropy, how mm -hmm. entropy and statistical physics keeps growing. You have to add energy into a system to create order, all this stuff. And I think that it's not that this is the same as that, but I think those types of processes that are everywhere um, shape our intuitions in the adding, right? Another, so, so the entropy example would be you drop a glass of milk on the floor in the kitchen and it breaks and the milk's everywhere. You can't just subtract. <laughs> you can't subtract right. that. You can't subtract from the situation. Yeah. You know, like the, the laws of physics only go in one direction and that is mm -hmm. in, in the adding and the adding of the increasing the complexity. So yeah. that's the thing or? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, that's a, um, a, you know, again, this is not something that we've, we've studied, but I, and I would love to figure out, you know, kind of more nuance on that. I, I tried to include a section in the book on entropy and I just didn't get far enough along into where I felt like it was going to be useful to the readers. And so that got edited out of the book. Um, but I do, so so I would say that I agree with your hypothesis, right? That there could be something going on there. And especially, <sighs> well, the line of reasoning I was going to use in the book, again, I said, I edited this out. So yeah. I'm not sure how in love with it I am, is that like, if we use that as a metaphor for how the world works, you know, and like entropy holds true in all these situations, but it's not, it's not like in our own decision making we're beholden to entropy, right? We we shouldn't not subtract because entropy can't subtract, right? And so um, no, no, there's no value in it. It's more that my 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 thought was just that this is what we see in many situations. So yes. recognizing yes. a situation where we have agency to subtract is is difficult because you know there are many yeah. situations where we can't. Yeah, and Ben, uh, one of the co-authors, like yeah, his he you know. We just don't encounter situations that lend themselves to subtraction as much as we encounter situations that lend themselves to adding, right? Um, and that's, uh, you know, if you're a, this isn't a physics example, but if you're a hunter gatherer roaming around, I mean, you're not sitting there thinking about what kind of building can I remove, right? You're just thinking about meeting your basic needs and, you know, passing on your genes to the next generation. You're not even thinking about that. You're just instinctively doing it. So, so yeah. And so I, I think like throughout human history, we just simply encountered fewer situations that we could subtract from. And you could see how that would be, could potentially be a reason why, you know, our mindsets don't, don't have us doing this. Um, yeah. Because I, so, so now I'm just, I'm going to, I'm sorry, I picked my rabbit hole, so I'm going down. No, no, I like it. I, I would like actually it. conjecture yeah. that, you know, subtracting is uniquely human. It's something that we can do and that, um, you know, may, maybe highly evolved primates can do because it has to do with visualizing a future and it's yes. our ability to visualize the future. Yeah. So when you go into the forest, it's all addition. If you think mm -hmm. about nature, nature just adds and adds and adds. It adds complexity. And I mean, a, a great podcast I just heard is the previous episode of this one where I talked to a biologist who, who talks about this insane complexity and interplay. So, so he has this picture of human beings as creatures that are not just our DNA, but also the DNA of all the microbes in us. So it's like a called the holo genome and how we're this highly evolved um, a symbiotic existence of millions of different uh, creatures, right? So nature just adds and adds and adds complexity and builds these big complex things. And that's the way that that happens. But humans, we, we're, we're operating on a different size scale. 
So the building blocks are different and, and, and it, the way that we construct it is much simpler and that's what enables it to be even possible to subtract. Yeah, but nature selects, right? You know, it adapts and then selects. And so, I mean, I think it, it does yeah. it does move towards greater, it is moving towards greater complexity, but it also has this ability to subtract when it's benefits or, yeah. But but it, but you don't, but uh, exactly, but the, the nature exactly does is they have iterations. They have millions of years to get there. So, so right. something right. goes up, they, they can turn it down over some generations. But mm -hmm. again, so that's, so the, I actually think there are two sides. There's like the size, scale that we build on that make it possible that the blocks we have are kind of meaningful to to, to have and they, they don't all hang together they're separable and then there's a time scale that we build one or maybe two uh of things so 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 yeah so somehow it's a uniquely human thing i think yeah i mean i i think that's certainly true right i mean and especially in terms of um I mean, when, when you think about like the, the roots of this behavior and like the, any kind of evolutionary roots of the behavior. And if you, I think there's a very important line. And again, this is book, not paper because it's conject, it's, it's more specul it's more yes. hypothesis generation, but um, you know, this very, this, you know, for most of human history, we couldn't imagine the future, right? We couldn't plan. We were just acting instinctively and so if if there's like an evolutionary route to our adding um or to this being uh you know kind of the default that we we think of um it 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 could be tied into those instinctive things just in terms of like accumulating food right uh or um some of the or displaying competence so this is one that uh, you know, just our desire to show that we can impact the world. And, you know, the psychologists in, in have shown that this is like a fundamental human need. And to the extent that it's really hard to show competence by taking away, that could be another way that subtracting is disadvantaged, right? You can, if you're a, a bower bird building a nest for, you know, to display your competence to mates, um, it's hard to kind of take something away to show mates that you're a good person to, you know, to pass down genes with. So, um, so yeah, I think that's really important that, you know, this, and, and, and probably true that this like deliberate act of thinking about what we can take away is a uniquely human opportunity. I was trying for the longest, I was it, so here in the Corona times, you have to take a long walk. So you don't just become some kind of zoom to zoom uh, yeah. vegetable. <laughs> Uh, so I was taking a walk and I was trying to come up with examples of animals subtracting to see if I could come up with something. And I had, I got nothing like the, the best I could come up with is, and I may have dreamt this when I was a child, so I might be wrong, but I remember reading about a trap for monkeys where you would put nuts inside a box that had a hole that was small enough that you could put your hand in there. If you it didn't have anything in it. And then you would okay. grab a nut and then uh, you, you could no longer get the hand out of the hole. Okay. The monkey basically wouldn't have the ability to realize that they could that drop that thing. Drop yeah. the nut. Like once they had it, they're like, I have my nut. And so you could trap them like that. So this would be a way. So I have no sources for this, but it was like uh, the best I could get that actually uh, turns out to, to whatever species of of uh of monkey or ape or whatever it was that they caught like this didn't didn't have the ability to imagine a future where they just let go of it again yeah so maybe it is really human but I, i'm i mean i'm i'm just making stuff up i love that yeah i so appreciate all the time you put into thinking about it i mean yeah i haven't uh no, but I, I, mean, I can't think of an animal reason either i didn't i haven't spent a ton of time on it but um I mean, the monkey example reminds me of the the pack rats and instinctively hoarding, right? And it's another example of kind of, you know, being wired to accumulate. And the you know the pack rats will immediately rebuild their stash as soon as it's taken away, and they're not like deliberately thinking about it. So, but yeah, evidence of animals think, subtracting. Interesting. I think building like it's there's very little disadvantage to having 
a store of something. There's very, you know, like being very wealthy, all things considered, even if you want to have a very simple life, would still be great to have a huge bank account, right? So, so, so there right. is kind of evolutionary pressure to uh, to have, even though stockpile. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, I I think uh, what it was it Jesus who had a different message, something about the birds and the sea. I'm I'm not a religious uh, person, but I do remember that he was kind of like, eh, maybe we can uh, uh, let, let it a l- little bit more chill about this. But but I think in general, you would say that there's very little adva- disadvantage. Like you wouldn't want to subtract cool, you know, like food resources or money resources or something like that. And I think that's that has to be pretty general. So it's more, I mean, part of why your work resonated so much with me personally is because I've been trying to simplify my life right now read there's a book called essentialism yeah that's about that's a great book by the way and that's yeah. about how to kind of choose fewer projects you know and design japanese gardens uh there's a famous german designer who was kind of the father of the design school that founded the apple products that johnny mm-hmm. ive was inspired by this guy called Dieter arms yeah. who had this beautiful thing is called he says there's a great movie about him and it, it, it stuck in my brain. It says, he says like, weniger, aber besser in German, which means less, but better. And I just, but better, yeah. I mean, that's so, so, but I've always thought of it as a philosophy for life. And I think it's a great philosophy for life, no matter the experiments that you did. But part of why the paper struck a chord with me is because you're suggesting that there's something deeper going on here, something a new bias that we hadn't been aware of that we can explore and it explains feature creep and it in software and explains a lot of different things. And so mm-hmm. that's why I'm, I'm super excited, <laughs> super excited yeah. about it. Yeah, it is fun. Uh, I, I, um, I was going to ask you a question. Oh, I mean, what do you think of just the, do you think at a unique time in history where subtraction is finally advantageous? I mean, just, I mean, the, at the grandest scale, just on when you see the research about we're exceeding planetary boundaries and not just in climate change, but in, in other areas. And so, you know, I agree that for a long time, adding was just like, you set it and forget it, right? You, you, you it might not be make things better, but it wouldn't make things worse. And, uh, but now we're kind of at a point where subtracting is because we've added for so long, subtracting has finally become advantageous. I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think, I think absolutely. I think that, you know, we have long recognized the beauty of subtraction in objects that were kind of meant to be as perfect as possible in art, uh, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for as long as, as uh, we've had recorded history, I think, artwork is about capturing the essence of something. Uh, science is also about the most parsimonious and simple descriptions of something. So, so I think for a lot, like, so this is also just me, you know, like saying stuff that I have no idea about. My, my sense is that, that, but, you know, like a, a, an observation that I, an observation that I would make is that, so I grew up in uh, Denmark, mm-hmm. which is, a more egalitarian, more socialist inspired environment. And it was a shock for me to come to the US and realize, like actually my son, my firstborn was born in the US uh, while I was there. And I saw all these young American dads and all of them, they were saying, what's your biggest concern? And, And they were all saying, I just hope I can provide for my son or for my child, I have right. some generalizing. I hope I can provide for my child. That's what they were all thinking about. And I was like, what? Like, I never thought about that. Cause I come from a place literally where like, no matter what you do, you kind of guaranteed a certain kind of financial safety. It's not like you're gonna be living in a mansion. It's not like it was gonna be well off, but you're all of a sudden in a situation where you have to think less about, for example, financial security. And what I see see here is that that matters to people in how they lead their lives, that people actually do focus more on having free time, the scarce resource that's optimized, 
is not just get making more money, right? It's also shocking that as you move around the US, a lot of people like your worth basically is identical, more or less, in my experience, I'm sorry for stereotyping to how much money you make, right? And if mm -hmm. you make a lot of money, you must be very smart, you must be very successful, you must be very good at stuff. Um, but there is a kind of a, this European tradition, I think of also recognizing, you know, people that are artists and poets or whatever. So, so like now it's very stereotypy and I don't want to offend Americans or, or anyone else, but, but I do think that as we begin to live more in a world of plenty and we're less worried about, then the hoarding becomes less necessary and we're quick. This is what I'm getting to, I guess. So we're quick studies. We adapt quickly. And similarly, in terms of simplifying life, I also think that for millennia, life has been mind numbingly boring, right? Like I remember just, you remember as a kid, uh, you were on the lawnmower and it's just boring. You just have hours and hours of nothing happening. So we've just been wired to say, okay, something happening, please let me add, add something yeah. right now, yeah. right? Let yeah. me just add more experiences. And so in very few years, all of a sudden with social media and content being generated by millions of people, and then a mechanism to sort all the most addictive and amazing stuff, put it right in your brain, we're just consuming more and more, but we're beginning to see the, the downsides to it. So I think that this repetition, like once you've seen in your little patterns that you can make things symmetrical by removing stuff, then you start removing as easily as you add. And so I think it's something similar I hope is happening that we're beginning to see that our lives are not necessarily good when they're jam packed full of stuff that we're, it's too boring to walk. You know, like I see kids outside my window going to school and they're watching YouTube videos on the side walking. <laughs> while walking because like walking is just too boring. And I yeah. think we're going to realize hopefully that we may want to subtract some of that. So, so, the, so my sense is that I think we're good at, I think we're good at adapting. And so I think the environment has been scarce. So we've been adding, once it's overflowing, we're gonna try and offload it. But I mean, I guess with calories, we're seeing that it's may not be so easy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot there. I mean, I Sorry. <laughs> that's really striking with the, the US example, because I mean, that totally aligns with my experience uh, with the, um, you know, this primary concern being providing for your family. And I, I've never even thought about like, well, what if I was more confident that my, that, that, that I lived in a society where, well, even if I didn't do this, my son's gonna and daughter are gonna have the same exact opportunities as everybody else. So that's, I would totally agree with that. And, you know, my own, and you know, this as a father is like, you're, that's a huge transformative shift in how you're thinking about the world, right? You go from thinking yeah. about like, I need to take care of myself to I need to take care of these other living things that can't do anything for themselves yet. Um, and so I would so totally agree with that. I will say, I mean, we didn't find any cultural differences. And we just did some really cursory investigation in in Germany yeah. and in Japan, um, and didn't find differences. But I do think that that's, you know, I, I think it would be really interesting to see how this um, how this phenomenon is different across cultures. And then your point about the also that this, this is a fixable thing, I think is a good one too. I mean, I know that like the the Kahnemans and the failures, these um, will often point out that it's really hard to overcome these like kind of foibles in our decision making. Um, and I think this one may be a little bit different uh and it because it's not a you know some of the things that they're looking at are you know we choose things right we deliberately choose this we're, we're wired to deliberately choose this way what we're talking about is we're not even thinking about it right and so what needs to happen is I, like you said like once we once we see the subtraction in the grids, can that carry over to other aspects of our lives? Once you realize that you subtracted to Marie Kondo your closet, can that um, can that carry over to when you're thinking about your schedule, right? And I'm hopeful that 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 can happen. And um, and even like the experimental evidence with the, you know, we talked about the repetition making people more likely to see it. I mean, it, reminders made people more likely too, right? So one of the cool things that um, 
you know, working with the behavioral scientists, they, we put a cue in there and it was like, you can remember, you can subtract. And they thought, well, we should cue also that they can add, right. So that we can show that it's not just a matter of the, that they're already thinking about adding. So when we, when we put a cue into the grid study, for example, and you say, remember, you can add or subtract, um, they would, the rates of adding stayed the same and the rates of subtracting went up. So again, evidence that we're not thinking of it, but also like really concrete evidence that if you just tell people, <laughs> if people, if it's, if you make it top of mind somehow, then, yeah. um, then they can do it. Yes. No, I think that's, that's very true. I have another comment on this. I'm sorry. I'm thinking it through as we, we go along. So I, another thing is that aggregation and getting stuff has also to do with our innate instinct to compete, which I think is also difficult to uh, extinguish, uh, right? Like we, we are competitive, uh, as you said, with the bowerbird, you show off. But as humans, we get very good at choosing new things to show off with. Like what I show off with now is different from what you showed off with in the 18th uh, century or even in the 70s, right? So, so, um, um, so yeah. maybe if, if actually subtracting became the, like, and that's also what I was getting at with the cultural differences is that here people are competing on free time. They're competing on how little they work or they're showing off that actually I had four kids and I knitted all their sweaters myself or whatever, right? This, by the way, is a real thing uh, yeah. for more uh, organic uh, wool, organic fairly, wool. fairly treated uh, sheep who grew up uh, had a great life. Yeah. Um, so, so I think if we could turn our competitive side to simplifying, and I think the environmental crisis that we're in will motivate something like that. So you can show off, then that'll fast track it also, right? Mm -hmm. Then the other thing is that I don't think it needs to carry over. I think that we could also potentially learn to I think we all already do that. We learn to simplify and make more economic each task that we repeat often. That's what we do. Like I make breakfast for the family every morning. And when I start out, you know, like let's say that we rent a vacation house or something. When I start out, it's, I'm not very good at it. But by the end of the week, I have it all planned out. You know, like I'm start the water uh, boiling yeah. at this time. And then that it, I can set the table. And by the time then, you know, I have the, I don't know, like the, the coffee ready for the water to be poured over. And you, so it's a joy to kind of simplify and find the essence in tests that you repeat over and over again. And so it does, it's not that that skill generalizes, but there are many such occasions of me doing repetitious stuff in my life. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, it makes sense. And it also is, I mean, there is pleasure in doing that, right? Um, like you yeah. said, you know, I think, you know, that it's hard to edit a paper, but for me at least, and I think for a lot of people who write, it's once you get to that stage where you're taking words out, it's it's a different experience, right? I mean, it's, and it, it can be, it can be fun. Um, the best. So, so yeah, and I, yeah, it's interesting to think about like competing on less too. I, uh, and, and I think like, you know, again, that ties back to that, like, instinct to show competence and now that all this i do think it it is possible to show competence through less um one of the examples that i like is um i think fundamentally that's what picasso and da vinci and you know bruce springsteen and i talk about him streamlining his songs and only like releasing 10 even though he's recorded hundreds and um so I think if you like subtract enough, it does become noticeable. You can show competence. You can, you know, get other people impressed with your subtracting. I mean, Dieter Rahm's, you know, same thing, right? He, that's why he's known is because he's, his designs are really streamlined. Um, and so I think that you know, part of the, I think we can display competence in a kind of system that we're living in. <laughs> just by subtracting even more, you know, not just like little ones, but kind of big ones that make it so obvious that, hey, what's cool here is that is that there's not something here. I mean, and even taking that to Marie Kondo decluttering closets, and you're, you're talking about um, imagining a future. If, 
I, I didn't, I hadn't heard of Marie Kondo um, because I'm an academic, right? And uh, so the, when I was, and then I'd start talking about this work and people would be like, oh, it's like Marie Kondo. And I was like, oh, I better figure out what she's talking about. And so I read her books and it's like some of her advice is really scientific. I mean, she, imag she tells you to imagine the future your future clean closet, right? So she's like painting this picture in your head of what subtraction is going to look like. And she tells you to declutter like all at, all at once and completely, right? So it's not this like incremental thing where you're not even going to notice a difference. It's like, get rid of all this stuff and you will, your competence will be shown by your decluttering. This is something, this is something I, this is another thought I had it just reminded me of it, which is the decluttering one one of the reasons why you keep all your old stuff is that you want worry that you're going to need it sometime right <laughs> like, yeah. and and uh and sometimes you throw you get rid of something and then you uh two weeks later you go like oh shit i wish i hadn't thrown out that you know yeah. old hard drive because actually i needed the cord for this new whatever and so 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 there is also this ever-present fear and so then I thought about the storage lockers and I, I had a beautiful analogy that ties into the paper writing. And when I say beautiful, I made it up and I called it beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to everyone. Um, but but it, it's like that the, the supporting materials is like the storage locker for your paper, that you have your beautiful streamlined paper. Yeah. And then you have all your ideas and you can't quite kill them because you love them so much. Right. Then you can... You can move them to the SI so that they're they're there when you there. when you need them. And this is this is somehow also interesting that the digital world also makes it less costly to not simplify fully, right? On my computer, this one here, I have a folder that's called documents. And in that one, there's a folder called old documents. And inside that one, there's a folder called old documents. And inside that, and so like every computer. Just throw I more just, stuff. I just have yeah. like a recursive, or it's not recursive, but it's a nested, um, nested uh, uh, all the way back to my first computer, my all my old stuff, and and it's not really adding complexity, but I can sort of, you know, the same thing with our photographs and stuff. So somehow we can, we can. It's less costly now to have everything and yet keep the surface less cluttered right do you know what i mean it's most it's also there's something different about the virtual space i guess is right what saying. yeah definitely um i and people have talked forever about having too much information though so but i i mean i totally agree that like it just enables our enables our adding and um the uh Yeah, but I mean, I, mean even, I didn't even have a question. I was just wanted to yeah, say yeah. this I thing, and then I got carried away. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's true, and and I think one of the interesting things when I was doing research for the book was like, okay, this 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 notion of too much information has kind of always been there. When when the when writing got invented, people were like, well, there it goes. We're never going to be able to handle this. It's yes. just going to be too much information. <laughs> and then when the printing press, same same thing, you know, it's like, oh, and it's like really smart people warning against yeah. this like deluge of stuff. So I think it's, um, there's a historian, uh, Anne Blair, uh, who has a really cool book. I, 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 I might get the name wrong, but you can Google Anne Blair. I think the book is too much to know. Uh, she just talks about the history of, of information and um, yeah, like, and, you know, we've kind of in, uh, you know, with books, you know, creating encyclopedias is, and, or um, kind of organizing and, and sorting books is not too different than what Google does today or, or Wikipedia does today. Yeah. So anyway, it's just interesting that there's a long history of it, but I totally agree that totally. the, um, I think the even tools... just writing stuff down, I think, I think might've been Socrates who was like, what the kids are yeah. writing stuff yeah. down now. Yeah. And it also came with a printing press, but even just the notion that you would like note it down. That's like yeah. the weaklings, you know, like if you're, yeah, that's what he said. It was yeah. kind of weak in your minds. Yes. <laughs> to read it down. I don't know all the proofs of, of the, of the motion of the, of the universe in your, in your head. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. All right, this is great. We're coming up already on the hour. I like always. I could go on forever. I want to end on one thing, which is, in a way, you know, if I compare the paper and the book, the paper is this kind of pristine, 
lives up to all all this high scientific uh, uh, standards of evidence and proving stuff. And then the book is in your way, your way of showing some of the ramifications, where you could see this going, all of these um, paths for subtraction. And so my question is, in now sort of establishing this universe of things that can happen, um, what's next? What, what are you gonna be exploring? I, uh, well, we, we have a meeting with our research group with Ben and Gabe yeah. and Andy on Thursday. My, I'm going to be pushing hard for the cultural stuff. Uh, I think there's yes. a lot of interesting things to learn there. Um, so like seeing, and I also think, you know, just from a, a laziness to <laughs> standpoint, yeah. it's like, we've got all the experiments. It, it's not laziness. It's just no. in terms of efficiency of our time and creating new knowledge. It's like, we know how to do this now and we can translate it to other cultures and see what's going, what's going on there. Again, like the paper does have evidence that this is also happening in other places, but I, I do think that there's more nuance there. Other cultures also other kind of, uh, like expertise, basically, what role does expertise and training play in this? Um, and then I think there's some other, you know, in my mind, there there's some other things in how we design, and I mean design broadly construed, and how yeah. we like take things from how we are to how we want them to be, um, that could be, are in need of similar exploration. So um, one, for example, is like this connection, like are we more likely to act on objects than relationships, for example, when we try mm -hmm. to make things better, right? So if you just imagine, you know, things as a network diagram, it's like, do we, yeah. do we play with the nodes more than we play with the, the connections between them? And I think that, you know, so, so it's less about subtraction and more about like this kind of the thought process behind design. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's super interesting and I could definitely see why your background is connected to design. And I can see, you know, in the book, you also give this example that designers actually have processes to find simplicity. They have systems where they generate a hundred different yeah. versions of the object so that they get this. And you could also imagine computationally at augmented finding simple solutions, mm -hmm. you know, exactly what is the thing that I can remove that'll, if you have, the second you have, you know, an objective function, you can optimize stuff. So you could imagine that you could have your computer help you as an architect or um, as, mm -hmm. as like, I see that there's, there's so much incredibly interesting stuff to explore. Uh, so, so I look, I look really, I really look forward to seeing uh, what's next. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I so appreciate the conversation. I mean, there, there's no more valuable hour of my week, probably month than, than, getting your insights on this. So I am sure some of the things that you've mentioned will will shape what's next too. So I, I really appreciate the time and the work that you're doing, getting getting the word out um, about course, what goes on behind the scenes here. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, but this is, I mean, this is one of my favorite things. That's also part of what I'm doing is it's just to talk, we yeah. get to have conversations. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that sort of is better in science than anywhere else in my experience that, you know, just meet people that are uh, driven and have are paid to have weird opinions and ideas, and uh, those often lead to good conversations. And and this was certainly really one of them. So, so much fun. Thank you for coming on. And uh, yeah, well, we'll catch up uh, another time. But it was it was great to meet you. And and uh, yeah, t take take care of yourself in this uh, crazy crazy time <laughs> yeah you too i'm gonna right. go read up on entropy so yeah <laughs> i mean yeah i mean we should uh we'll get we'll have like a one a time with uh some hardcore physicists in here and kind of uh, yeah. figure it out um uh more but there's a, definitely a connection to 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 that i think and the question is oh shit i mean it's impossible to stop because it's so exciting but yeah <laughs> well we already cut it you can you can just clip it at the <laughs> yeah, this is good but there is for sure something but what I think is unclear is, is, is it just part of shaping our intuitions or is this, does it somehow run deeper? Is it just right. because we're used to living in a world where lots of things where this happens. are yeah. irreversible, where you can't simplify that you can only add and because we're used to that, then we have a hard time seeing it or is it, or is it deeper? And right. if it was deeper, it would be cooler. Uh, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> no. 
All right, man. Thank you so cool. much. Take care. Have a good day. Bye.